Ray, Vi, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Oh, great to have you both. Well, tell us, where, where do you live? We live in Sutton, Surrey. And have you lived there a long time? No, we've been there since 2004. I was brought up in Brixton, and Vi was North London girl. And how long have you been married? 47 years, I had to get that right, didn't I? 47, mm, yes. you're edging towards the gold vibe. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Well, the silver, did he, was it a good one? Oh, yeah. Yeah, too right. but heading for gold's better. But heading for gold's better, isn't it? Yeah. Now, May the 26th, 2001, um, completely changed your lives. Yeah. Okay. Well, it was May the 25th where it started, sorry. Where it started, yeah. that's right, in the evening, of course, when yeah. you got that call. Right, tell us, tell us the story of what changed your whole life. Well, it started in the evening, I come home from work. We got four children, three boys and a girl. And our third child, Christopher, was indoors. He was getting ready to go out, and he asked me I'd give him a lift to his mother, to his sister's house, sorry. And I said, no, I'm too tired, so I can't That's drive. right, he wanted to pick up his clothes, didn't Yeah, he? he stayed with her for a couple of days, yeah. a couple of weeks, and wanted to pick up his clothes. I said, no, like most days, yeah. couldn't be bothered. And he went, fair enough. Now, every Friday night, him and his brother, Phil, and a few friends would go to a, a youth leader's house and stay there till two, three in the morning. As he was getting ready to go out, he did something he'd never done before. He kissed me in the forehead and told me he loved me. Yeah. Never did that, ever. And went out. If I came home from work, we do what most Christians do, unless you've got a cha chaplain in your house. <laughs> Watch Coronation Street, have your dinner, go to bed. Typical Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> no Bible on the table. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 20 to 1 in the morning, the doorbell rings, and I'm thinking, how can two boys forget their door key? Went up the door, instead of Chris and Phil, there's two policemen. They asked me about Chris and Phil's dad. I said, yes. They said, we need to speak to your wife urgently. I said, what's it about? They wouldn't tell me to we got fire out of bed. They said, Chris and Phil have been involved in a fight. They said, Chris is seriously injured. We need to get to Repsom Hospital straight away. We live in New Morden, so it's a nine mile drive. As I grabbed my car keys, the policeman said, no, we're driving you. The car was touching 100 miles an hour at the Blues and Twos going. And then, and then it stopped, didn't it? It stopped on the roundabout. Yeah, and it, it wouldn't stop. It just start. stopped, yeah. The police car. Yeah, we're in the back praying like mad, and all of a sudden <laughs> it just started up again, and they took off again. And this is a four lane A road, and this was closed. The right hand side was like Christmas. There's all these police cars lined up, police walking up and down, weren't they? And the policeman kept apologising to us. I said, don't worry about that, let's get to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, Philip and his friend Richard are in forensic clothing. What they do, they take all your clothes off you and put like a white boiler suit on. Yes. Philip's face was all blooded. As I'm talking to Phil, another policeman came up and said, You can't see Chris, they're operating on him. Now, we told this story in prisons and in schools, and what we make them do is walk the walk of a victim. Because tonight you might see some poor soul has got stabbed and there's only 30 seconds on the telly. You don't see what goes beyond that tent. Yes. Now, a, a lot of you watch Holby City and, and, and Casualty, that's the biggest load of rubbish on telly. <laughs> because they don't put you in a lovely waiting room with leather chairs. We were put in a room with two horrible wooden chairs, and they just shut the door and leave you. And that's how victims are still treated today. While we're in the room, I asked Philip what happened. He said, Chris and Richard came to his shop. They worked in a pizza shop up in Tolworth. They had a bit of peace, laugh and joke. And Phil got paid. And back then it was cash. And Chris said, shall we get a mini cap to Jill's house? Phil said, no, let's walk. It's a lovely summer's evening. That's unusual for Phil. If he can get a mini cap from that wall to that wall, he would. But that night... At the unusual, he, he said, no, let's walk. Twice Chris asked for a lift, twice refused. So they're walking along this road singing Oasis songs, enjoying the evening, and there's a hill. And coming the opposite way on this hill are 14 boys and girls, literally out of their head on drugs. As they approached our three, they opened up. There was no sign of a threat. The 15-year-old, wanting to get respect from his friends, punched Philip so hard in the face, his nose ended up on his cheek. Philip's first reaction was that. He clicked the bone back, the pain was so severe he collapsed on the floor. Two boys started stamping on his head. Christopher went to save his brother, there was a fight. They backed Christopher onto this main road. Another good boy got behind him. They got him on the floor. They took penalty shots to his face and body and stamped on his head. Woman shouted from the house, the police are coming. They ran. One of the girls went to get Chris out of the road and the oldest boy said, leave him there. 
A car came over the hill and in course she said she thought it was a bundle of rags in the road. She ran over him, his belt caught in her exhaust pipe, and she dragged him 40 metres down the road. When Freddie came through, the first thing he saw was Chris on the wheel of a car. Another woman came running out, she said, I'm a nurse, you can't touch him, and she held Phil until the ambulance, police and fire brigade arrived. While we're hearing this, the doctor said he lost a lot of oxygen to the brain. We're looking at severe brain damage. In other words, he'd be a vegetable. Then 20 to 4 in the morning, when you see the police, the hospital chaplain, and the doctors, when they walked in the room, they didn't have to tell us their face told us. Christopher died that morning because one young boy wanted respect from his friends. I remember smashing my head off the floor and a doctor grabbing hold of me, and you left me, didn't you? You ran. So when you were told, uh, how did you react, Vi? I ran out the door, because I didn't want it to be us. I wanted it to be anybody else but us. I kept thinking, we've got a good life. You know, we know Jesus, we know the Lord. Everything's so lovely. And everything you know is gone in a second. It's just gone. So I ran down the corridor, because I want to go home and, and go to sleep. And, and hope it's, it's just a dream. And, but I got down the corridor and I ran into the arms of a policeman who was crying and he, he said, we're going to get them. And that's the moment I got really angry. And I started shouting and I was screaming at him. And I said, nobody cares. You don't care. And out of my pit of my stomach came this voice saying, I'm going to kill them if I get hold of them. And I started shouting that out. And you better find them. And this rage just came up. And he was hugging me. And he said, I'm so, so sorry. And you're going to have to come back to this little room. And they'll come and get you in a minute. And you have to go and identify him. Not we'd like you to, but you have to go and identify him. They brought Vi back to the room. I'm looking at the Phil. Yes. Then a chaplain comes and he said, we, we prepared his body for you now. Which one do you want to come? We didn't want to go. In fact, I was hoping to be someone else. And that's sickening. Yes. I hope they made a mistake. We both went up together, didn't we, in the lift? Yeah. At the end of the corridor, there was two doctors and a policeman. You know, you need to pray for our policemen. Because mm -hmm. this happens every day in this country when there's a murder, not just once or twice, every day. Yes. Don't know how they do their job. I went up and I said, can we donate his organ card? Uh, can we donate his organs? He carried an organ card. I said, no. Now you imagine being a policeman having to say this to parents like us every day. You can't touch your son. You can't hold him. You can't cuddle him. Christopher became what is known as a property of the coroner. Yes. Well, Roger, my friend's a coroner's officer. And he said to us one day, he wasn't just our property, Ray. He was a crime scene. Well, I lost it in the board. And I said, the last thing he did was kiss him the forehead. And if you don't let me kiss him, I'll take every one of you. Please or not, you'll go down. And they had a talk and said, kiss him, but keep your hands behind your back. We saw one of the police a few years ago, didn't we? He said, we are human beings. We wouldn't let you kiss him anyway, he said. Don't worry about that. It's called contamination evidence. Yes. Look, everybody can touch him, but mum and dad. And I remember this big policeman saying, is this your son? And I just fell in his arms crying, and he hugged me like a father. Then we had to ring our other two children up and tell their brother's dead. Then we were rushed home. And this is what it's like. You've got your family in and out, innit? your friends in and out. <laughs> when they're there, you wish they'd go away. When they come back, you wish they were, you know, you don't know where you are with them. <laughs> yes. Everybody wants to make you a cup of tea. Yeah. As if it will be OK. <laughs> yeah. But of course, it won't be OK. Then the doctor comes and wants to give you sleeping pills and Prozac. Mm -hmm. Like you go to sleep, you wake up tomorrow, wouldn't it, by and it'll be better. And then I started getting angry. And I wanted to rip my kitchen cupboards off. I was getting angry with yeah. God, to be honest. I was getting angry with him. You smashed every plate in the house. She smashed all the plates. I pulled all the cupboards and I smashed all the plates. And mm. Ray was getting so worried, he called our, our, our pastor around, who came round immediately. And what, and he said to the pastor, you ripped all the I, cupboards off. She said she's gone off. mad. Yeah. She's ripping cupboards mm. off the walls. And she's, she's a Samson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How I did it, I don't no. know. But just pure you rage. You just had all this rage in you. Mm, absolutely. How, ha, tell us about your other children. How did they respond to what happened? Well, our, our youngest grandson was born with 13 cancers in the eye as a baby. And our eldest son was looking after him in hospital. He did what we call a night watch, and his wife would do the daytime. And I had to ring up my daughter and I said, Can you tell Louis's brother's been killed? 
He left his son and came up to us. And he, and he said, what do, I don't know what to do, Dad. I said, go back to your son. You can't do nothing for Chris. Chris is dead. Go look after your son. My daughter left her phone off that night, and the policeman called it a defogram, knocking on the door. Sorry to inform you, your brother's been killed. But there's a shock for you. Coming home in the car, do you want to tell him? <laughs> Coming home in the car from the hospital that night after hearing he was murdered. Go on. Ray looks at me and he says, Vi, you know we're going to have to forgive the boys who killed our son. <sighs> don't you dare say that, I said. Don't you dare. I'm not going to forgive them. They don't deserve it. They're animals. People that do things like this. I'm not having any of that. I'm screaming and shouting. Don't you mention that word forgiveness again to me. And it all goes really quiet because I'm a bit volatile in the car. <laughs> Nobody wants to speak, so... I dug the but hole. You're, Ray, you're saying that in the car on the way back, yeah. Yeah. having had all those emotions, yeah. but you just felt that was God. It was two things. One, it was we only just became Christians in 96. In 2001, he was killed. So I knew how much I was forgiven. But I said to God, it was my faith, but my belief in Jesus had done it. But I also, with my background coming up in Brixton, I said to God, it was a fight that went wrong. They didn't wake up and say, let's go kill Chris. It was a fight that went wrong. You couldn't get it, could you? She just couldn't understand it. I didn't want but I to knew get I had it. to forgive, because if I didn't, I'd be serving three life sentences right now. To be honest with you, I'd be in prison right now, because I used to know some tasty people before I came to Christian. <laughs> so, OK, let's um, yeah. piece the story together. Three, three people were prosecuted. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I've got to tell you, God is so fantastic. He brought a policeman into our life called Colin Sutton. I don't know if you've heard of him. He's done a program at the moment. It's on there. Martin, Martin Clunes is playing him. How he caught Levi Benfield, called right. Manhunt. Okay. And he walked in our house, and the first thing he said to me was, "Ray, I will never lie to you." And as soon as he said that, he got my respect. He put up an accident sign. I said, "Why did you put up accident when it's murder?" And listen to this. He said, "If I put up a murder sign, no one will come forward." What does that say about our society today? No one would come forward. In fact, he got 28 witnesses. And 11 o'clock that night, Kill got, Chris got killed, died 20 to 4 in the morning. 11.30 that night, our door knocked, the liaison officer, she went, we got them. Two girls went to the police station, not seen Colin on the telly, saying it's a road accident, and gave everybody's name as witnesses. What do you think of that? That's God, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And they found the, the three that actually did it. Well, they, they arrested them all, but the witnesses only saw three doing the most damage. And um, we were taken to a magistrate's court to start with. Well, yeah, we were taken to a magistrate's court. And in that court, one of them asked, could he break, break his bail conditions and stay out till one o'clock in the morning to celebrate his birthday? I went around to laugh, aren't you? Mm. The judge says to me, open You're your angry. mouth again. You'll be arrested and put in prison for a contempt of court. Christopher would have been 19 a week after he was killed. And this young boy is asking to celebrate his birthday, which we both got angry with, didn't we? So from there, oh, sorry, we're jumping here. No, it's fine. We had to wait till Tuesday to see the coroner. Yes. She took over an hour explaining his injuries. Nearly every bone in his body was broken. The brain damage, in the end, we said, can we just see him? We don't want to hear no more. She took us in the room. He was wrapped up like a mummy. When we first saw him, this side of his face was smashed in from the kicking. She bandaged all that for us. We went in, we had a policeman in the room, make sure we didn't touch him. We prayed over him, we talked to him. We were told we could see him again. If we knew that'd be the last time, we would have stayed with him for longer. We came out, my daughter went in with her husband, and the coroner said, I've got bad news. I said, what can be worse than that? She said, because of the kicking in the car, I have to prove what killed him. To do that, I had to remove his brain, wait for an enzyme to come out. This takes 16 weeks. You can't bury him for 16 weeks. Do you know what I said to her? I said, that's not my son in there. My son's in heaven, do whatever you like, because at 15 years old, he gave his life to Jesus, and we know where he is. Amen. And that's the only comfort we had, wasn't it? That's the only thing you can hold on to that's absolutely right and true when everything else is gone. But when did you catch up with <laughs> Ray? <laughs> because obviously <laughs> Ray said, oh. we've got to forgive so when did you okay let's just piece it together for uh, our, all of our viewers okay three of them got prosecuted three of them got prosecuted they went to we went we went to 
uh, Guildford's Magistrate Court first, then it was referred to the Old Bailey. Now in the Old Bailey, they got a, what's called a witness protection room. Then the courts have got these. You go in this room, telly's on, tea, have coffee, everything. Then the case gets called. Now these boys are on bail. And I thought even though they're on bail, they'll be sent down to the cell and brought up from the staircase. We goes in the foyer and sitting about just where the walk, a little bit further, yes. where that light is, are the boys with their parents. And we're sitting right opposite them. <laughs> and they're laughing and joking. And the only thing, even though we're Christians, the only thing stopping me and Vi getting out of the chair was a policeman holding us like this. He knew what we were thinking. And one of the leaders of our church who sat and held our hands and prayed when we couldn't. He prayed for us when we couldn't. So the case took six weeks. Lie after lie after lie. The jury went out on a Friday, came back, couldn't make their mind up, came back on a Monday, made their mind up. The first one we're not allowed to name, so we say the boy. He got, he was 16 now, he was, he was the one who started it, he was 16 now. He got um, a Majesty's Pleasure, ready for this, for murder, six years. The 16 year old got life imprisonment nine years and the 19 year old got life imprisonment 10 years for murder. Robert Banky get 40 years, kill someone, but what you say by But if it's rape, right, if it's life imprisonment, why, why nine years? That because that's a sense. tariff. That's a tariff they get. And they're sent out. And they're almost called life license. That means they're doing their prison sentence even though they're outside. So if he comes in there tonight and robs a glass of your water, it robs that glass, he could be back in for 99 years. Okay. And he's got that for the rest of his life. He can't go to Australia, New Zealand, America. He's barred from all them countries. He has to sign on probation so many times a, a month or maybe a year. He has to live with that for the rest of his life. And like we always say they're doing their sentence now, they're in prison. Sure. So they go to prison? Yeah. Okay. Vi, when did you catch up with uh -huh. Ray on the forgiveness? Here we go. Well, it took me a year to get my head around that one. Really, seriously, and um, a lot of soul searching. And, and people coming to me, and, and I remember one particular guy who was in our church then, and he was an evangelist, and I knew him very well, and he said, Vi, when he grins at you, you know you're in trouble with him, yeah. and he's grinning. And I said, yes. And he said, Jesus loves the boys who killed your son. Whoa, don't you talk to, don't you dare. And he went, but you see, I really love you. And when you get it from your heart to your head and back again, when you realize that actually Jesus came for everyone and when they come to him, he will forgive them. What are you going to do? And I went home and I said, who does he think he is? But the problem is, you see, it's like a song that won't go over your head, you know. Yes. The Bible says the truth will set you free. And he spoke the truth to me, and he was right. So I've got to choose. And I realised at that moment it was a choice. That it wasn't about how I felt, because how I feel is a mum with full of anger. And that's how we always feel when people hurt us, don't we, in any way. So then you f knew that you had to forgive. I knew I'd have to choose it. Now, how can you forgive someone who isn't remorseful and repentant? Mm. That's, not, that's not up to them, is, is whether they're remorseful or not. I mean, if someone's dead, you still have to forgive them, doesn't it? It doesn't matter. It's not, it's not about them. It's about setting yourself free. It's putting that glass of poison down and saying, I'm not drinking that no more. So did you, Ray, and Vi, consciously one day how did you do it well the turning point well i forget that night and i had to keep praying for it the turning point of revival was in the old bailey when the boys were found guilty we were taken upstairs to the canteen and one of the fathers followed me up and he went like that he went i'm sorry and i just went over and hugged him and we had some words not the nasty father one yeah, of the fathers yeah not nasty words we had a few private words two weeks later you, they get found guilty then you go back two weeks for sentencing we went back two weeks for sentencing, we were in the same canteen, the same father walked in, bought a cup of tea, came back. As he's walking back, I stood up, put, put out my hand. We talked for about 20 minutes. Colin Sutton said, I've been a policeman 30 years and I've never seen such compassion between two men. And you know what he said to me? I followed you up the other, reason for one re the other day for one reason. I went, what was that for? He said, I thought rather than meeting Kingston, let's, let's get out in the old Bailey, I wanted you to hit me. He wanted me to hit him because of his son. And I said to him, what if Chris got a lucky punch in? I'll be standing where you are. 
And we both, we both um, walked into court together to the annoyance of the other parents. And that's what did it for you, wasn't it? It's a conscious decision to see the human being behind what they did. It's a conscious decision to forgive, to walk God's way. Every moment of every day, we're choosing it because that way we're free. That way we're free and, and we can't be the judge for them. Did you feel that when you, like, you, d you made that decision, I've got to forgive these three boys, um, but then the next day you had to keep forgiving. Oh, yeah. Come it's like a constant. Come with me to Christopher's grave and see how angry there's a, I can There's get. a great book by R.T. Kendall. <laughs> yeah. And he says, when you can forgive and name the three people without getting angry, that's total forgiveness. So. I read that book after a week after Chris got killed, I read that book. Mm. And I gave me, I passed it on to you and she threw it. <laughs> <laughs> I picked it back up. <laughs> now, let's, let's kind of wind the story. Yeah. Okay, you eventually met the three boys that murdered your son. You actually met them. Yes. Tell us that story. Well, we, we, um, we tried a few times to meet him because I wanted the truth. In fact, to be honest, we got a phone call from a local church. We were on um, a television program, the Trish program, talking about forgiveness. And two days later, we got a phone call from a local church saying, Stephen, is, that's one of the boys. I've seen you on telly. He's having nightmares. We'd like to meet you. I rang by up and said, Stephen's having nightmares, want to meet us. I can't repeat and hear what she said down sure. the phone. Yeah. So we, we met his wife. Yes. We tried to arrange it. The professionals weren't trained back then and they ruined it. We tried another time, that got stopped, and another time that got stopped. So we wrote the letter to what, them. So the professionals were, were stopping? getting in the way, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah did they fact, give a reason why? No. They didn't, they, they weren't trained. That's why it's called restorative justice. Yes. Yeah. That's why today they're all trained properly. And, and they all get a certificate. Sure. We make sure they're trained properly because we're okay. part of that. So from when uh, you wanted to, it took it how took long? Us, it took us uh, 11 years. 11 years? Yeah. We, we, we met a lady called Sean West, who's a good friend of ours, and she's our chairman in our, in our charity. And she said, how come you, you do... We, we've been doing prison work now for about since 2004. We got involved in a programme with prison fellowship called the Sycamore Tree where victims get a voice. Yes. You come in on week three and you, you tell your story and we have seen so many lives change. It's not just us and why, there's, there's other victims do it. And you, so many lives have been changed because of this programme. It's got to be the best in prisons. So she said, how, how come you're doing all this prison work? You met the boys. I told her, she went, can we have a go? Okay. So this other charity called Calm came around. Yes. And they got talking to us and we were going to meet one. We were going to meet the, the ninth, uh, Ryan because he was the most remorseful we were told in prisons. They went away and came back and said, um, we've got a shock, all three wants to meet you. So I said, okay, what we'll do, so Joe, you don't get no time off for doing restorative justice. You know, people think you do, it's an easy thing, it's the hardest thing, to walk through that door to meet your victim, is worse than doing, well, visiting the hangman, believe it or not. So she said, all three want to meet you, how do you feel? We both said, yeah. So the first one we were going to meet was the youngest one who started it. Yeah. Now, in court, when he was found guilty, he shouted at his dad, I'm innocent, dad, I didn't do nothing. They ask you questions. You notice they're asking the victims questions. Who do you want in the room first? I said, me. She said, why? I said, when he walks through the door and they shake his hand. They went to Wayland's prisons up in Cambridge, come all the way back a couple of days later and said, what have you done when they shake your hand? I said, dear, can take it or leave it. So we're sitting in the room and I'm watching the door. The door opens. And he walks. The first thing I noticed, he had a suit, shirt and tie, haircut and polished shoes. That's respect. As he walked in, I just went, come here. He walked over, put his arms around me, hugged me and said, thank you. He then looked at you, didn't he? Can I hug you? I said, yes. But he still looks like this little boy. You see this 15-year-old I last saw, and he's 26 now. And, and I said, hey, young man, do you know what? He went, well, I said, we forgive you. Move on and have the life Chris can't have. I don't know who got healed more by actually saying that. Him or me or Ray, everybody in that room. It, it was like he took a sack off his shoulders and threw it on the floor, and I think we did too. Because you can say it, and then you can say it to the person who's hurt you. And that's another thing, isn't it? 
What was his reaction when you said he that? Cried. He just, he just like, like I said, he just. Phew. He just cried, yeah. because he doesn't think he deserves it. You see, remember I called them animals. Well, I saw the human being, not the animal. I saw him the way Jesus sees him, the way he sees us. And that was remarkable. Truly is only of the Holy Spirit and wonderful. At the meeting, he speaks first. The offender normally always speaks first. And he said, while I was in prison, I fought the system. I said, we know all about you, mate. They gave me an extra two and a half years. He said, they put me on this program, something like what you do, it's what we do. It's what we prayed for yeah. him to do. And it wasn't a murder <laughs> or anything. It was a little old lady who got broken into who was telling her story. And he went, from that day to this, I can't get Chris out of my head and out of my heart. And every time he mentioned Christopher's name, we noticed he put his hand on his heart. What did he say to his dad? I'm innocent. He looked us in the eye and said, I was a 15-year-old coward. I murdered your son and I'm sorry. That's all we wanted. That's all we wanted. We didn't care about anything. They could have, that was better than locking him up for 40 years. We got the truth. The second boy we met was he, about eight months later in Epsom, in a, a community hall in Epsom. We were in the basement. And it's a big, long room. We're down the end of it. As he came in, he walked in. As, he, as I saw him come round, I stood up again. We broke all the risk assessments going. He didn't walk up to me, he ran. He ran up to me, grabbed hold of me, I grabbed hold of him, so tight I couldn't breathe. And he was crying on my shoulder, kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This went on for about 10 minutes, then he ran over to you, didn't he? Yeah. Here we go again, another oh. hug. And another, yes, please forgive yourself. But I don't deserve it. But you do, you see, because you can't move on. If you don't forgive yourself for what you do, You'll stay back there in 2001. You will never move forward. And if we don't forgive you, we'll stay back there. We've all got to move forward into the future, whatever that is. So, you know, you need to choose it. Do you know who I found hard to forgive? <laughs> Me. Because I didn't give him a lift that night. If I gave him a lift to his sisters, he'd still be alive today. And it wasn't a pastor or anybody else taught me to forgive. It was Colin Sutton. He took, pulled me aside one day, this is a policeman, and said, what if someone bring Chris back? What do you do more on a Friday night? So, I mean, didn't go to bed. You do what most fathers do. He says, let it go now, or you'll be, you'll be very ill. Yes. And he learned me to forgive myself. And your listeners need to learn to forgive themselves. It's the hardest thing. We can forgive everybody else, but not ourselves. Yeah. Now, I asked all three of them to come to Christopher's graveyard. Stephen is the only one with the, with the brain, with the guts to do it. It was a horrible wet day. We turned up in our car. He came in his van and his probation officer came in our car. We showed him where Christopher is. I see he's a second grave right down the bottom on the left. As you walk down to his grave, you've got 87, 96, 75. All these people got alive. You come up to his little grave, 18. He has some garage flowers with him. Love his heart. We went for a walk. I, I did say, God, you're asking too much today. We went for a walk, came back 20 minutes later. He's still on his knees in the mud. I said, get up, Steve. I said, we're all here. Chris is here, we're here. Chris had this attitude. I won't use the four-letter word, I'll use a different one. Sure. Who happens? Yes. Get on with it. It does. That's, and we live our life to that now. I and I so. said, look, if Chris was alive, he'd tell you, get on with your life. And we're giving you permission at his grave. And he went, can I come back? And of course you can. I know he wants to bring his wife and child. What if there's anybody here? I don't want to offend no one. See, I was thinking now, from the cocky young so-so to... I said, Steve, no one knows you from Adam. If anybody asks you, I'll save his friend. We can't change the past, mate, but let's all move into the future. What, what were we doing in the graveyard, in the, in the car park? We were showing him his photographs of our granddaughter, and he was showing us a photograph of his son, Elliot. That's quite something, isn't it? From a long way from their animals, isn't it? Isn't no. God wonderful? The last one. Yes. We met him on the 13th of March, 2013. Goes to show how long we had to wait. I want you parents to hear this. He walked in the room, more hugs, and we sat down. He said, when everybody ran, I kept stamping on Christopher's head. I thought he'd get up. I heard him moaning. I gave him a few more kicks. I still thought he'd get up. He was moaning some more. He said, then Norman was shouting again, the police are coming. He said, I ran to the alleyway. This is how he described it in the meeting. He said, I saw the headlights of the car come up over the hill and up another Chris and drag him. I still thought he'd get up. I said, were you stupid? He said, no, Ray, it works in video games. I said, no, you can't use that as an excuse. That's not acceptable. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. I killed your son and I own that and that's the truth. But it was a symptom of an unreal world I lived in 
and I lived in it so long and I, I drank and then I took crack cocaine and it's all unreal worlds. That's what I'm describing to you. And it's probably not the first time we've heard this across the world, is it? But I did it and I, I repent of that and I tell you that. He teaches rugby. The other boy, the oldest boy is a plasterer, got his own business. And the youngest one is a tattoo artist, got his own business. They've all got their own business, they're all married. If I was at a show not long ago about restorative justice, a man came up to you and spoke, didn't he? He said, um, you're talking about so-and-so. And I said, yeah, I didn't name him. So he said, but I know him and I've known him for years. And he is a good man now, I want you to know that. And it's all because you met him. Wow. Do you know, I've got to tell you, Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Mm-hmm. Our own understanding just brings trouble, doesn't it? But he is, wow. Isn't it awesome? Awesome. We had and a wonderful word from a friend of ours a week after Chris died. She said, when the seed is sown, the harvest will come. Yes. Then she said, the seed is Christopher. When you bury him in 16 weeks' time, the harvest will come, and it hasn't stopped, does it? And the harvest goes on. And that's freed you to do the work that you're currently doing yeah. mm-hmm. with restorative justice. Yeah. Yeah. You're going into schools, you're going to prisons, yeah. um, and you've set up a charity. Chris Donovan Trust. And, and we've just been awarded MBEs. And you've just... <laughs> which was the thing I was just about to say. <laughs> oh, sorry. But tell us, you went to Buckingham Palace? No, but I did. I did because uh, I saw Princess Anne, and yes. she's obviously the patron of the Restorative Justice Council, and she said, Vi, do you do know the jury is out on restorative justice in this country? Well, you know what? I pray that the jury comes back really, really quick. Do you want to laugh? I've got a wife of mine. We need it. Why? Because I was born in Ireland. Yes. I was born in 51, come over in 52. Yeah. <laughs> and they said, you're Irish. I went, yeah. You have to go to Commonwealth House for yours. They don't even put your name on the, on the, on the, regi- on the oh. um, the, what do you call it? Oh. Honours Oh, the honours list. list. They don't even get your name on the honours list. Because? Because I'm Irish. Because it's Irish. <laughs> <laughs> you're, from where? From Cork. No. Yeah. I said, I said to him on the phone, my granddad died for this country, my dad fought for this country, my brothers were in the uh, British <laughs> Army, my sister Doesn't was in the mean. British Army, I joined the British Army, it makes no difference, he said, you're Irish. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did Princess Anne say about that? She didn't Not know. Not a lot. <laughs> no, so you've got know. yours. Yeah. I got mine, and, and it was really sad, because Ray had to sit there and watch me. Yeah. But you're getting yours. Uh, well, we are MBEs, it's just yeah, a medal. Yeah. yeah. We are. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know when. <laughs> 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 they did the same to Bob Geldof. No. They made him a sir and then put his name, yeah? And he's not allowed to be called sir, he's got to be called four different letters. You can't call him Sir Bob. You've got four letters before his name. There you go. And Bono. So. Well, learn something yeah. new. <laughs> What about the future? How do, what, yeah. how do you see it? Well, we've got, a, we've got a new film coming out very soon. Yes. And um, Absolute Truth is called. Yes. So when we go to the Lord, that can go, we're hoping to get it into schools and prisons all around the country, maybe around the world. And once that's out, we're going to sit back a bit, aren't we? Are you? Hopefully. <laughs> okay. Who knows I don't, what the I don't Lord's think got in mind? No. I don't think we will, because every time we look at a diary, I say, we've got nothing on for a couple of months, then the phone starts ringing. That's yeah. the most dangerous thing to say with God, as you know, isn't it? Your story, you wrote it in Restored and Forgiven, yeah. and that's available where? In cr- Christian bookshops on Amazon, or if they eat, go on our website, they can buy them all for us cheaper. And your website is? ChrisDonovanTrust.org. And Kindle. And Kindle, yeah. <laughs> Ray, Vi, you truly, you're an inspiration. Um, wow, you're a, a trophy of God's grace. And uh, it's, it's great to hear uh, your story, a little of your story, and to hear of how your lives have been transformed, but the way that God's using you to transform other people's lives. And 
Uh, we pray God's blessing for you in the future to see many more lives transformed. Ray and Vi, thank you. Thank you.